Italian riders have won Milan San Remo on 50 occasions and this is the 98th running of this long race. It's always at the beginning of the season, it is the longest race of the year and now we'll see who's been doing all of those winter training miles. I'm Phil Liggett, alongside me here is Paul Sherwin. Paul, it's 294 kilometres between Milan and San Remo. Um, one would expect it to be a flat 294 kilometres, but it is certainly not that. It is normally regarded as a race for the sprinters. However, in the past, riders like Eddie Merckx have laid the foundations of their victories on the final climb of the day, the renowned Poggio. Well, Eddie's still the record holder, and nobody's going to improve on that today for sure. He's won it seven times in all. Last year's winner, Filippo Pizzato, won a great sprint finish, and he will ride with number one on the team. He's on the Liquid Gas squad, and he'll be looking to have perhaps repeat on that today. But we'll see. Uh, the big winner, Eric Zabel, is also back and riding. So too is uh, Oscar Freire, who won this race back in 2006. The last Frenchman to win, by the way, Laurent Jalabert, back in 1995. It's a very traditional route, this, and a fairly flat, fast opening. And then the riders, as Paul will tell us, get down to those little cappies. Well, it starts off right in the heart of Milano. They cross over the Col de Torcino before they see the Mediterranean for the first time. And yes, it's once they've turned to the right there along the coast, they start the very difficult series of capos with the Capo Berta, the Capo Mele, the Cipressa down towards the end at 25 kilometers to go. But I have to say the most important, the most famous is the Poggio down at the end. End. Riders signing in at the start today and being introduced to the crowd. Chance to see new teams, new colours, and let's hope we have a great season. Just Axel Merckx there, just riding away, riding out his last season. He said he'd like to ride this year at the Tour de France and then retire as soon as it's over. Gregory Ratz there signing in, the champion of uh, Switzerland. Paolo Bettini, he's going to get a huge round of applause here. World champion now and winner of last year's Tour of Lombardy in the World Championship jersey. Philippe Gilbert moving away, Carlos de Cruz, the French rider from uh, F. De Jeu. Now the new team has been brought in here as a wildcard team, Team Tinkoff Credit Systems. We've already seen them race this year in the Tour de Lancarme to a fair amount of success as well. And race well they did too, I have to say. Yes, you're quite right. And uh, that was lovely warm conditions. That was what some of the riders were doing in getting ready for the new season. Underway now, the roads are still damp here and the long arm warmers are on. 197 riders checking out and the first crash of the day, quite a melee down there. Well, uh, quite interesting you say melee because the next climb of the day is the Capo Melee. It really is a race uh, de designed for dangerousness, this race of the Milano San Remo. There are always nasty crashes. One of the riders from Credi Agricola has gone down very hard indeed there. As you can see, we're just looking at the, uh, the rider is OK, but it's very slippy here. There's a lot of a problem there for Team Sonia Duval. I think that's David Miller looking after one of his teammates. Yeah. Chaos is really how I would describe Milan San Remo. It always is. It always has been but it's a great race anyway and these guys are gonna to have to work pretty hard to get back into the race now they spent rather a long time delayed there and the mechanics getting back into the cars as they rejoin the action well the race itself i can tell you let's have a look oh, in the show again i wonder if there's anything to do that car parked on the left of the road here very unusual well, to see the cars left there no well they're very often left in the road at, at milan san remo they don't clear the route away as they do in many of the other races uh, well uh, in advance and in fact it is always dangerous coming into these towns because riders are so nervous to stay at the front end of the main field they take incredible risks and that's when you get a crash like that it just tends to block up the road couldn't quite see the number of that Credit Agricole rider down there, but it might well have been Christian Marini who was on the floor. Anyway, back to the action now as we join up. This is Andrei Kunitsky. Let me give you a little bit of the background as to what has happened as we join the pictures here. These are the three survivors of a six-man breakaway. After covering 46 kilometres in the first hour and averaging 46.2 in the first two hours, Six riders got clear. Pavel Brut, who's still up here, Andre Kunitsky, who's still here, and Aitor Hernandez. They are the three survivors. The others were Emmanuel Seller, Kern de Kurt, and Roberto Traficante, but they have now been dropped. They've had a lead of seven, nearly eight minutes, but the peloton, as by tradition, Paul's ridden this race, by the way, are now chasing them down. 
211 riding at the front there, Alessandro Pataki. He'll be looking for the win here this afternoon. He will hope that his man, Eric Zabel, will pilot him down towards the finish line. Eric Zabel, a prolific winner of Milano San Remo over the last few years. This is the part of the course where the riders start to get very nervous indeed. It's the repetition of these little climbs, the capi or the capos, if you like to call them. But I think the first serious one that all of these riders are concerned about is the Cipressa. It's a very difficult climb, put in a couple of years ago to try and split the race up and prevent the race being a race for the sprinters. However, it never really seems to have succeeded in doing that. Well, they've not got far now. This is Pavel Brut here, but the peloton, as they started the climb of the Cipressa, was just 30 seconds back. So they know they've got this breakaway under control now, although they're still trying to slow it down. There were Tinkoff riders near the front. As our camera nips along, look, we're going to start picking off the leaders here, I fear. They're saying 30 seconds. Somebody stopped already on the right there, taking a wheel change. I think that's actually a, a spectator is it, is it? at the side of the road, yeah, just <laughs> having a look back. This is the Capo Berta. You can recognise it because just towards the top on the right-hand side there, there's a, a number of cactus plants, which uh, I always remember as if I could just hang on in the main field to the cactus plants, I was <laughs> going to get over the top of the climb with the rest of the group. Let's hope they never cut them down, otherwise there could be problems there for the riders. Well, these are the pacemakers now. Remember that Milram here. They've also got uh, Eric Zabel, who, probably just despite his victories here in this race, and he's the last German to win it back in 2001, he's also the last German to lose it when he was beaten on the line, waving to the crowd as Oscar Freer got through on his inside. That's probably the one he remembers most of all. This is Thomas Vakus on the front, a big, strong rider on Team Discovery Channel. Riding in fourth place there is Yaroslav Popovich. He's a man who may well have a chance of performing well towards the end of this race. Spent a lot of the early part of his career actually racing in Italy. Just moving away, they've gone over the top now of the Capo Berta. They'll drop down into the small town of Imperia, and then all of a sudden they'll start to accelerate as they look now towards the Cipressa. The distance between that leading group of three riders and the main field now is a minute and eight seconds. That's not enough to win Milan San Remo at this point. Not when they had almost eight at the base of the Tocchino, where Emmanuel Seller was first over the top. They only lost 45 seconds on the big climb there, which came at 120 kilometers. Uh, but Sella now back in the pack and just those three survivors and we're not seeing too much of them right now Aitor Hernandez, Buscadel Uscardi, he was 136 in the Tour de France last year it's about the best performance we can give you on him here they are now for the first time rider in the red shorts there, Aqua Saponi, only 22 and this is Andrei Kunitsky who was second in the under 23 road race championship uh, last year well, dropping away from the capo now, you can see these riders, uh, there's another crash there. You see this is the race of the crashes, just coming down there, just coming around a sweeping bend. This rider went down very hard indeed, and that in fact is one of the riders from Gerald Steiner. That's David Kopp who's gone down as he comes down, and it looked rather a nasty fall there, and there's a couple of bottles lying around. Well, there's a couple more riders, riders too. Down. Now that's Kopp, no, that, they're saying Vakers, well that's certainly not a discovery rider. Maybe we'll get another shot at it. It looks it's like it's Wegman. Wegman is the Wegman. other rider who There's went down There's two Gellersteiners. As well. This one is cop here. Oh, it does not look good at all. This no. is a crazy race in Milan San Remo. It's a race where you have to battle to stay at the front end of the main field. The doctor is there very quickly with him. Fabian Wegman was one of the other riders who went down, but in fact, I think two riders as well went down from Team Gerolsteiner. Well, they are both Gettelsteiner riders, you're absolutely right, and uh, Wegman and Kopp appear to be down, and it looks as though uh, David Kopp here is out. Well, he's the sprinter on the team here, who would be expected to do pretty well, and he won't be there now, because uh, that looks a little bit more than just the casual fall, so it's really sad for David Kopp here. We first uh, met him when he rode for a smaller team, La Montre, I think it was, and he used to race in South Africa, and that was when he started winning races, and he said he'd left uh, the T-Mobile team of the day, it was Deutsche Telekom then, because he didn't want to be second fiddle to Jan Ulrich, who he was supposed to lead out in the sprints. He wanted a win for himself. Well, he certainly started to do that. That's a shame. Anyway, let's go back up to the leaders now. These are the three survivors of a long, long breakaway today. If they make it to the finish, they will have been in the lead for just about 210 kilometres. 
Well, that's I don't the think they're going to make it. 48 seconds. This is the town of Imperia that they're going through now. It's down to 48 seconds, as you say, but very shortly, once they leave this town, they will head up to the uh, slopes of the Cipressa. And that is a very difficult climb. And the main field will then start to accelerate as they start to decant and get the weaker elements off the back end of the main field. As you said, Phil, this is a very long one-day classic. There in the distance is the Cipressa. They ride right through the very heart of Imperia, then take that right-hand turn, and the climb begins, and they throw all caution to the wind to try and reduce the size of the group from 70 or 80 riders down to 30 or 40 for the fast descent then down to the start of the Poggio. I would think depressors are probably a better name than the Cipressa for the leaders now because that gap is closing down. These riders will want to close it down fairly quickly. The Poggio is the one where people try to escape and take a few risks on the way down, but invariably, not always, they come back together for that big sprint down at the bottom. There are the three leaders now heading towards the start of the climb of the Cipressa, and that comes uh, at 27 kilometres to go to the finish. Pavel Brut, we never heard of him until this year, and in February he was riding very, very strongly in the Tour de Lankawi in Asia. Those long flowing locks makes him pretty easy to pick out. Been a great rider in his career on the track. He's uh, been uh, re represented Russia a number of occasions at the World Championships in the points race, and here he's turning his hand over to being a very good road rider as well. Another Ooh. crash. You see, this is why so, so many riders are so nervous here in Milan San Remo. Another crash has gone down there. Looks like a rider's gone down from Barlow World. I think, I think they're both Barlow World, aren't they? That's a, that's yep. a, how strange is that? We had two riders from Gelugstein and now two from Barlow World. And, and that uh, looks like Jimmy Casper. That's unibet.com. It, it could well be Jimmy Casper. Well, uh, this is Phil. Phil, I have to say, this is what this race is all about. It's always been about this. It's always been about crashes. And it's a very nervous race. You know, it's quite possible in Milan San Remo to use a complete set of brake pads. They're saying it's actually Marco Zanotti yeah, who's Mar gone down. Marco Zanotti it is. I just saw his number on his bike there. And uh, looking at his face now, it's not Jimmy Casper the sprinter so he's still in there and riders take advantage for a quick bike change we might get a better look at it here and it's right at the front of the peloton couldn't be in a worse position Zanotti was right there in that white unibet.com jersey and now they're all taking it back and there's no real reason for this I don't know why that happened because there was fear it was right at the it's, it's fear and nerves as everybody knows they've got to stay in the first 15 to 20 places as they make their way through Imperia because they know once they go out of Imperia there's the right hand turn to the start of the Cipressa climb and there it's almost impossible to move up and if you start the Cipressa in 40th place you might as well almost give up any chance of winning Milan San Remo well the mechanic getting on with his job in hand they're getting the wheels ready just in case they're not he wants to continue but the ambulances are also hovering so I suspect he might be out of Milan San Remo in any case he's not going to get back Oscar Freire in the centre there he won this race a couple of years ago as the riders continue just caught a glimpse riding at the front end of the group as well as Thomas Vokler, Testa della Corsa, front end of the race. These three survivors, but they know that the gap is coming down fairly dramatically. I'm sure the next time we get a time check, it's going to read around about 30 seconds. Well, this is Hernandez doing the pacemaking here. 24 years of age for Uscutelli Uscardi. That young lady's a few years to go yet before she starts racing. Well, there's a little, uh, as our helicopter now flies just off the coast here, chance to see Milan San Remo down the beautiful uh, coast road, but we don't stay on it, of course. We dive into the little climbs before we finally finish up in San Remo. You'd go the same way if you kept on the coast road, but that would be no fun, would it? 30 kilometres to go, just under 19 miles to the finish. And that leaves us around about... Uh three kilometers away from the top of the Cipressa. There you can see Vukla up into second position, the man who uh, wore the yellow jersey in the Tour de France for 10 days a couple of years ago. He's obviously in good form in the early part of the season. Also moving up, you can see a lot of riders from Milram. They'll be looking after Alessandro Pataki and not far away there, I can just see Eric Zabel also. I thought I caught a glimpse there, the champion of Luxembourg as well, Kim Kirken, who seemed to be pretty near the front. The yellow jersey there is Ricardo Rico. Now, he's a young rider who just uh, ah. made his name available to us in the recent uh, Tirreno Adriatico. A very good rider and a tip for star stardom in Italy. Looking for the slopes that you press her first, and that looks as though Pavel Brut is trying to go away. The other two have got him under control just about. Hernandez uh, freewheeling up, and uh, Kunitsky, who's the youngest rider up here at 22 years of age, is a Belarus, by the way. 
and uh, he's a good road race rider he's got plenty of future he's been the national road race champion elite when he was under 23 of belarus back in 2005 so he's settling into the big pro scene oscar ferrer riding pretty close to the front too in those colors of rabobank just now Everybody very nervous now. They're just waiting for this right-hand turn, and once they start it, it'll be absolute pandemonium as everybody tries to see whether or not they can launch the attack that splits the main field. Tom Boonen, I'm sure, is fairly much to the front end of the main field. This is the kind of race that Boonen really likes. It was his teammate who won a year ago, Pipo Pozzato. I'll tell you what, just be, this, it is a helpful win, but as always in Milan San Remo, this has been a very, very fast ride. Nearly 300 kilometres, you'd think we'd be out here all day, but far from it because of the nature of the course and usually the direction of the wind prevailing. These riders fly in 56, uh, 46 kilometres rather in the opening two hours, a very quick start to the day. Not long now before these boys find the slopes that you press. They certainly haven't slowed down, they certainly haven't given up hope. Uh, but the field are closing in all the time now. Well, it's just around the corner, if my memory serves me correctly. They take this uh, left-hander, then all of a sudden the right-hander is there right in front of you, and that's where the Cipressa starts. There it is, almost as if I was riding. What a shame, they could have gone straight on. It was much uh, shorter and far less hilly. 18 seconds the gap now, that's all they've got here. And it's Liquigas leading the charge, and that's because Filippo Pizzato is the man. This is, in fact, a Petito here setting the pace. Pizzato was the rider who won last year. And Hernandez, well, he's the climber in the group, has gone for it. Salita Cipressa, the climb of the Cipressa, and Hernandez has tried, but I think that's pretty much just to prolong the agony. It's always chaos. You see, this is a chaotic race, Milano San Remo. The motorbikes get in the way, and this group now is starting to split up. But before they get to the summit field, they will be caught by the front end of the main field. But I've just seen Bettini shooting out of the pack, or is he? No, because he's in the cars. Well, I've got a feeling he's coming back for a flat tyre, but we didn't see him have that flat tyre, but it looks as though he's making his way through the cars. What a place to have to get back, right on the climb itself. The worst Hernandez, place possible. the death throws, is it, of the breakaway now, as Aitor Hernandez tries to go clear. He's on his own because he's killed off his two breakaway companions, and those legs must be very, very tired right now. Well, if you pull back, you can see the breakaway companions just a little bit further back behind him, but not too far away will be the front end of the main field because this is a very strategic part of Milano San Remo. It's an important part. All the sprinters want to be at the front end because although the race doesn't always split on the climb, it very often splits on the descent, and that's why you have to be careful. Look at Bettini. He wants the win here. He's having to ride past all of these riders who are currently being dropped. He certainly had a mechanical incident, he Phil, has at the yeah. wrong time and that is really bad luck because he's going past these riders who are finished for the day he just thinks he's getting on the back and then he looks up and he finds there's another gap to be bridged at this stage of Milan San Remo he's got to be giving away race winning effort here as he continues to cut through them somebody's getting a free ride there by the look of it but he's a world champion, let's not forget, and he wants the world champion's jersey to get back into the main field because even if he can make contact with the main field, even if he can't win the race, there's always the chance that his teammate Tom Bonin can come up with the win as well. Which would go down well, but perhaps not in Italy because the Italians would prefer Paolo Bettini to win today, but just look at that peloton and Bettini just about to get onto the back of it. There he is down there. It's an awful long way. He needs a few deep breaths now. As he continues, he's come up there on the uh, Boyd Telecom rider, that'd be Frank Orenier. He's not waiting for any help. Look, he's now starting the long journey through all of the traffic. Well, what he's got to do is he's got to keep moving up all of the time because as we get closer to the summit of this climb, more and more riders, Phil, will get dropped off the back. Here's little Tommy Vukla looking over his shoulder. He's trying to move off the front end of the main field. Well, at least he puts himself in front of the television cameras. You can never take that away from Tommy Vukla. And somebody from Rabobank here is trying to bridge the gap here. Wouldn't surprise me if it's not somebody like Juan Antonio Fletcher. And he's the most likely, or we'll never know, because he's about to get swept, uh, swept up here by the whole of the field. And Liquid Gas again trying to uh, levy, levy uh, some sort of a control on the peloton here for Pizzato. And this rider once more, it's the same man. No, it's not, it's Quinziato now. 
who's come clear. I thought it was uh, Petito again. Well, Quinziato going past Thomas Vokler, but they've still only got about 25 meters off the front end of the main field. It's hard to imagine the speed that the main field goes up this climb. This is one of those climbs that you're going up in the absolute big ring at full speed in excess of 40 kilometers an hour, and you're almost begging yourself to sit up and forget about it. Why am I hurting my body so much in the early part of the season? Just looking up uh, through the main field, there, you just keep getting a glimpse of the sign, the sign of the rainbow jersey of the world champion Paolo Bettini he's still in the main field Quinziato now could be setting something up for people Pozzato Pozzato would love to win this race if he can the gap not very much no but Voikl has done well to hang on here he can't help him but he's hanging on as they try to pull clear the field once they flip over the top a little bit of a downhill as we head on towards the Poggio and uh, Voikle, he started the move, but he can't do much about this pressure attack here from Quinziato. And Quickstep, thinking of Tom Bonham for the sprint, are also leading the charge back there. And I wonder if they know that Paolo Bettini is at the back end of the main field, trying to wind his way forward. He'll try and stay in contact, try and move up to 20 or 30 from the back, and then hope that there's a deceleration after the descent and he can move to the front end of the main field. Look at the face of Thomas Vokla. He always tries maximum when he gets into a breakaway situation like this. He's gone to the front to try and help. Quinziato. It's still a long way to the summit of this climb. You see how fast they're going around these corners. Bear in mind, Phil, this is actually uphill. Yes, and judging by the gears they're pushing, you, they don't believe us. But well, it doesn't matter. Back. Take a look back, boys, because we're all together again here now and no split at all. Just very quick tempo riding and still have quick step trying to control this now. Lamprey also have candidates who win. And up on the inside, once again, are coming the Leaky Gas boys. They're trying to keep it all nicely together. These motorbikes getting just a little bit too close. Well, a little bit of Italian coming through there, telling everybody to get out of the way and try and make sure that it's a safe race for the riders. So you can see a lot of pressure on at the front end of this main field. Tom Bonin obviously can't be too far away. I'm looking to see. He normally rides the Cipressa right up at the front end of the main field because he's not really one of the great climbers, Tom Bonin. That's Bonin there in fifth position. You see, he wants Milan San Remo himself. On the long line, Specialetti is the rider from Likugas who's got onto the front now. Now it's just a chance here as they settle just a little bit that uh, Bettini might uh, nip through a few places. He's still stuck at the back of the peloton. And the, the, the uh, quick step rider there just caught a glimpse of him. It didn't quite catch his number for you, but uh, he's oh, it's 163, so that makes it top. It doesn't look like Tom Bonin, is it's it Tom, Tom Bonin? Bonin? That is Tom Bonin. Just on his wheel oh, is Alessandro Pataki, number 211. You can see the big bouncing style of uh, Tom Bonin. You can't see the rainbow bands from this altitude. Well, there's Oscar Freer, he's riding about six men down. It could be a crossing of swords of those two great sprinters if it comes down to it. Watch out also for Pizzato. He stands out pretty easily with uh, only the number one on his back. Uh, but team. Bonin, it's interesting, Bonin hovering very near the front now and has told his team to chase down that earlier breakaway. Quite clearly believes he has a chance today. Well, it's a race that Tom Bonin really wants to win if he can. He'd like to get himself across the line in first place. Paolo Bettini is still struggling. You know, it's so unfortunate if you have a mechanical problem at the wrong time in a race. And for Paolo Bettini, that was certainly the wrong moment in the race to have that flat tyre. Quick step have got control, looking over the shoulders there. They're looking to see where is Tom Bonin. Is he OK? Well, the answer to that question is yes, he's in fourth position. He's not right now going to make any kind of a move. He just wants to be at the front over the top of this climb and he wants to be at the front over the top of the Cipressa for what will probably be a large group sprint towards the line. Well that was Kevin Van Imp uh, who was doing the climb. I think he's the nephew of the great uh, Belgian climber Lucien Van Imp who won the King of the Mountains title uh, six times in the Tour de France which was equaling the record at the time of Federico Balamontes. Well, there's another little move trying to go away this time. It's Gasparotto, who's gone clear. You've got to say that Liqui Gas are trying to soften the race up, certainly in favour of uh, Filippo Pizzato. They certainly have a plan here this afternoon is to make these climbs as hard as possible as he rides off the front end of the it's main Pelizzotti. field. It's actually Pelizzotti. You recognise him by the long flowing locks underneath his crash helmet. A star of the future, they say, for Italian cycling here. He's riding on his own account. There may be a little bit of uh, a dummy there because uh, with those long flowing locks he could very much easily be mistaken for Pippo Pozzato as well. Well this is Gerolsteiner putting in a little move here. Well they've lost two men out on the road today that we know of in the same crash. 
Uh, but at the minute, it could be Stefan Schumacher who's trying, but it's not. It's Andrea Maletta, 133, who's got up there to Pelizzotti. So, two strong men here, desperate moments these, one of these moves might work. It's a horrendous climb this, because it's one way. of those gradients that you think this race, this climb is going to be over, it's nearly finished, then all of a sudden you go around a corner, there's another kilometre to keep going upwards. The main field starting to stretch into a line at the front, but this is not, Phil, the critical climb of the day. It's the first race, the first climb, it's the hors d'oeuvre. The main climb for me has always been the Poggio, that is the most strategic point of this whole race. Well, we just saw the face there of Maletta and also Pelizzotti. The tandem here trying to break something of it or just hang out and be the tempters for the rest. But the peloton has sat up just a little bit and he's back here. Nobody's starting the reaction. They're waiting for another move. Far side is Kim Kirken, the champion of Luxembourg, just watching everybody on T-Mobile. There comes the reaction. It looks like Case de Palm. Well, they're lifting the pressure at the front end of the main field. Everybody now is trying to do something here this afternoon. In fact, there's a rider moving off the front there, and this looks to me like Yaroslav Popovich making the move. Well, this would be a turn-up of Popovich, a very strong man. We'll think of him more perhaps in the Tour of Italy or the Tour de France, but he's trying to get some form into those legs, and he's still here very much so. And a huge effort now to try and reach two leaders. That would make three very good riders up front, but of course the Poggio would decide all. Well, they've still got the descent of the Cipressa first to negotiate before they get onto around about a 10 kilometer section of flat road in between the Cipressa and of course the Poggio. The main field slowing down a fraction. I think they're quite happy with the way they've got over this climb. Now it's Team Lamprey getting themselves organized on the front end of the main field. So this is almost the Lamprey team time trial with a little intrusion here from Eric Zarbel's team, Milram. They know they've got to bring back these three. They can't afford to, this to be a long chase as they go into the very narrow street that they just about got through that gap. Well, this is the town of Cipressa. This is basically the summit of the climb. They ride across the town square and then they start the descent, which is a very dangerous descent as well. The leading group of three now are on the descent and I've seen a number of nasty crashes over the years on these descents. In fact, on this particular corner, I saw Jan Raas crash and go over the top of that crash barrier. Well, there are four previous winners, and as far as I know, they're all in this leading group. Paolo Bettini won this race in 2003, Oscar Freire 2004, and Alessandro Bertacchi in 2005, and indeed last year, Pizzato. And those four riders are still in this leading group here. Eric Zorba, well, he's won it four times, but the last time back in 2001. And there's the world champion. Now, where is he in the peloton? He's still got a bit of work to do, Paul. Well, he's uh, moved up to uh, around about 30th position, so uh, once they got towards the summit of the Cipressa, he moved his way through that main field. All he's got to hope is he can uh, just get his heart rate to come down a little bit, try and get rid of that lactic acid, recuperate, if he can, on the 10 kilometres which separates the bottom of the Cipressa and the start of the Poggio. But Team Milram, Phil, have got a lot of riders at the front end of this main field. Popovich has made the junction now, so we're looking at three riders Look how dangerous these descents are. If you get it wrong on a descent like this, there's no way off the road at all. You're straight into a brick wall. Well, there's a beautiful sight. As Milan San Remo snakes its way away through the greenhouses here, heading back to the valley and the river and the ocean below, rather. As we see these riders trying to cause a reaction here to get us back up to those three leaders. The two-pronged attack from Milram. Eric Zorbel normally is supposed to lead out Pataki these days. But who knows, they're both capable of the win. But first of all, you've got to catch the three riders up front. And Milram and Lamprey seem to be showing the most interest. 12 miles to go. 20 kilometres to go to the finish as they continue to snake down. It's still a very large group, Phil, as we've, as we've been over the summit of the, the climb of the Cipressa. And in fact, I would say there's still between 80 and 90 riders still in contention. There's a rider there up at the front from Team Rabobank. They'll be thinking, of course, oh, this is... Oh! That one is a very, very nasty crash indeed. That's the Gelsteiner rider, Maletta, who's hit that. He was in the move earlier on, but I didn't like the way he fell there. I, this is such a dangerous descent. The Poggio as well is a dangerous descent because there is nowhere to go. There is no soft landing if you get it wrong on a descent like this. And he went down very hard. I just hope he's OK. That was a major shock. Well, he thumped right into the wall and to the telegraph pole, I think it was. I don't know if we'll get another shot of that, but that was a very, very nasty fall there. I think it was Andrea Maletta. We didn't get it long to spot him. 
but uh, Gerolsteiner, you could say this isn't their Milan San Remo today because that's the third rider we know of out with a crash and there is in fact they all seem to have ignored him completely as, and just about now here we are going to see it again it was Maletta in the leading group and he really did hit that very very painfully indeed completely unsighted I can't understand how he went down there because uh, it just as it, it was as if he, he lost it. It looks as if uh, maybe he'd had a flat tire because he was going straight into that corner. The doctor's there, up alongside him. Well, he was in that leading group. Uh, Naroslav Popovic was behind him, but this doesn't look good at all. He could well have broken his leg there for all the way he hit that. Well, that was a very hard, post, abrupt stop, but it was not a, a soft landing at all for this rider. At least the doctors are there immediately. The doctors are immediately on hand to look after him. Well, the trouble well was this has got to be one of the bloodiest Milan San Remo's I think I've ever seen. I've always known Milan San Remo, Phil, as being a race of accidents and crashes, but I don't think I've ever seen any quite as dramatic as the ones we've seen this afternoon. Well, we haven't seen, uh, we have certainly seen some bad ones, that's for sure. Well, the trouble is that that has taken out one of the men from that lead group of three now. That well has reduced their chances here as the, the boys from Lamprey, this is Patsy Villa here and trying to just uh, get this race back there. We're staying with the pictures of uh, Maletta on the right. And the, the rider here from Milan, by the way, is Celestino. He's a classic win in his own right, but I think here more interested in getting back up to those leaders. Well, I'm not quite sure what's happening here with Pachi Villa. I can only think that these two riders have managed to get away on the descent of the Cipressa. The two riders at the top are the two leaders. That is Yaroslav Popovic, and he's with the rider that started the move, uh, uh, po Pelizzotti. The two riders at the bottom, Pachi Villa and the rider from Milram, I think are two riders who managed to get clear on the descent. So they're in third and fourth place on the road, riding on the flat section which separates the Cipressa from the Poggio. Well, Maletta is uh, quite conscious and seems basically okay, but they're not going to move him. He will go into the ambulance, which they've called up. I suspect there uh, he's broken that leg because of the way he hit that lamppost. Back with the uh, two remaining leaders here, Pelazotti totally committed at the moment, and so too is Yaroslav Popovic. They'll be missing that third wheel, though, to give them some relay. You ride Vila and Celestino are the next two riders on the road, and they're only 10 seconds away. Well, if the four riders get together, they've got a serious chance of getting to the foot of the Poggio ahead of the front end of the main field. The big problem is that once you've made a massive effort like this over this 10 kilometre flat part, you take the right-hand turn to the start of the Poggio and then all of a sudden there's no oxygen left, there's no power left in the legs. This might compromise the attempt of Patakio Zabel in the sprint here because Milram will have a man in the four-man leading group and that will put Celestino up here. And uh, we keep going back to these pictures. I think we've seen enough of them personally, but uh, it looks as though uh, he will be taken to hospital and they'll check him out completely. Check on him in the press tomorrow, but I hope he's okay. Very unlucky. He was right in the center of those three uh, descending riders. Maybe for a moment he lost his sight line, but he certainly never made the bend and he should have done because uh, Popovic was behind him on the same line and got round quite comfortably. I tell you, they're all very dodgy corners uh, on the descent of the Cipressa. I've seen danger there in the past. The Poggio is pretty much the same. These two riders have now got a 10-second advantage over the two chasers and a 20-second advantage over the front end of the main field. This man we're looking at, Yaroslav Popovic, really is sheer class. One day, he's going to win himself a massive bike race. And look at the power. He just sits there rock solid on his machine. The thing is, you're committed, you take gambles, you hope they work. If they don't, well, after all, you are human, you can't do it again. So you've got to hope sometimes luck is on your side. These two are fighting very hard to rejoin those two, but the pack is not far behind them right now, Patsy Villa. As he continues towards the line now, made his name in Paris-Nice, and has got good form. Celestino, oh not quite sure what to do. Looking back, you can see the front end of the main field. He knows he's got a job of work to do here this afternoon. Really, he's supposed to be looking after Alessandro Pataki and Eric Zabel. That's where we're going to in the distance. So that is the town of San Remo. But to get there, we're going to go over that nasty little hill over on the right-hand side. Unfortunately. But you see, you can always take the shortcut on the bottom row, which many riders do, by the way, when they're off the back and decided to abandon the race. They just go the shortest way home. Uh, but it's the Poggio, as always, the final uh, jumping-off point before the finish down in Milano. These are still the two leaders. I wonder if it would have made any difference if Maletta hadn't crashed, because they're still clear. 
It's still clear they've got about five kilometers now to the right hand turn. That's the Poggio, the climb just in front of them. These two riders are really now acting like a carrot in front of the donkey because they're just in front of the main field. The main field waiting to pounce, the main field waiting for their acceleration to place their leaders in the first five to ten positions once we take the right hand turn for the start of the Poggio. The two riders on the left hand side, the right hand side, are the two leaders. They're still working very well together, but they've only got 20 seconds and they're not increasing their advantage while the main field fill is waiting for the moment to accelerate and pounce. Three Italians on the attack of the four riders. We do with coming together, but we know that the main field is only a handful of seconds behind the second two riders on the road. So we are going to see an explosion on the Poggio climb. There's no doubt about that now as uh, they want a reshuffle of the pack. Well, they've just brought back the two men in the middle back into the fold, Pachi Villa, and you can see the rider from Milram there is about to move up to the front end of the main field. He's got a job of work to do here this afternoon. He's got to now turn it around and start looking after his man, and his man is Pataki. But Quick Step have now decided is this is the moment to put the pressure down and get their man. Bonin is right at the end of that line of dark blue jerseys. He's waiting. He wants to win this race. This is one of the big races that riders like Tom Boonen would like to have on their resume. But despite the effort here of these two riders, the gap prized out is 26 seconds. Despite the chase, Paolo Bettini is in the centre of our picture right now. He's on quick step and he's joined the team in pursuit. Somehow on that climb, there he is off to the right, he has managed to come through that huge pack of riders. It's amazing. Yeah. Well, let's not forget he is the champion of the world and he's a very proud man. This is regarded as one of the great races of Italy. He is the world champion. He would not like to see the world champion's jersey abandoned at the side of the road and he would not like to see it riding at the back end of the main field that's why he's dragged himself to the front well all of the quick step rides are here Kevin Holtzman is a rider doing a major amount of work in this pursuit here and the man they're all trying to do it for is Tom Bonin or is it Paolo Bettini he may have given away too much energy in that chase back these two rides are hanging on, but I don't think you can win Milan San Remo if you hit the Poggio with only 26 seconds. Well, they're not too far away from the start now of the Poggio. They're going to go through this small tunnel in a moment. They'll come out, and on the other side, it's about a kilometre to the right-hand turn. They're all, you can see the main field is also in the same town now as they take that left-hand bend, and right in front of them, they'll also see the tunnel through the cliffs. All for Tom Bone as far as Crips are concerned. We've got a third place finish, outwitted by a fast finishing Filippo Pizzato last year. He was a bit surprised, but he took his chance well. Although it appeared, if you were watching it, to be a sprint, in fact, Pizzato had made a winning move and they simply never caught him. See if he can pull the same stunt today as we head towards the finish. We're heading towards the lower slopes of the Poggio. Into the tunnel. Two leaders. Who's going to come minute. out? <laughs> Yeah, it's got a way your cameras can't go into the tunnels yet. We haven't worked out the technology for those signals, but 28 seconds is still the gap. Terrific ride by those two riders, and would it have been more if there had been three riders? But look at the chase here by Quick Step now, who seem to have taken control of Milan San Remo. Well, they know now in the next kilometre or so is probably the most strategic kilometre of Milan San Remo. It's that right hand turn for the start, 12 kilometres to the finish line. In fact, we're only about seven kilometres away from San Remo, but you take a right hand turn and go uphill for two kilometres three kilometers before plunging down into the outskirts of San Remo. These two riders are still working well together, but I don't feel, Phil, they've got enough yet to win Milan San Remo because the gap is not stretching. It's locked in still at that 26 to 28 second mark. Well, it's almost impossible to ride away from the peloton now because they're in full cry and they know the finish is round the corner. So they've literally they've got to just keep going as best they can. They're not going to pull away any further now. It's a question of hanging on and hoping that there is a slight relaxation of the pace. I think the field is just waiting for the explosion on the Poggio. Robbie McEwen. Uh, yes, and he always says he only he's only ever got to the finish twice and when he got there he was involved in a crash and then he got mixed up and missed a split in the sprint. But he says if he can get to Milan, Milan San Remo this time he's got a real chance of winning. And he's right there. Well there he is, just sitting uh, a little bit too far back for the approach to the Poggio. He needs to move up into about 10th or 15th place. Boonen riding confidently at the front end of the main field. 10 kilometres to go for the two leaders. Now we're not very far, it's a very nervous moment now from that left, that right hand turn. I would say Phil, not really very much more than a kilometre and a half. 
Time to get nervous legs now as you head up towards the climb. This looks like a little bit of a climb anyway here as Popovic and Pelazzotti try to hold off the rest of the field here and here they come and nobody now can control anything because it looks as though CSC have got the men on the front and Quickstep won't be unhappy about that. They've done a lot of work here. You've got to keep these riders in a vacuum now and keep everybody away from them because the move could happen at the blink of an eyelid. Well, Team CSC are always a team for the start of the season. There are the two leaders and all of a sudden the main field over. is right behind them. Less than two or three seconds, it's all over for those two men because the main field is now completely and utterly on fire. A different team on the front, Team CSC, but look at the speed. A few moments ago it was half a minute, now it's nothing. And now we're about to start the climb up towards the finishing line here. That's Fabian Cancellara, the world time trial champion, who's driving on the front of the race right now. There's the flick onto the Poggio. They've still got the lead just, and they're still out of sight, but I think the whole train is going to thunder up to them right now. Well, as soon as you hit the first kilometre, you see the acceleration. There's the front end of the main field. Stuart O'Grady will be looking to do a fine performance here as well, but all over the front, you can see it's Team CSC. Tom Boonen's not the kind of rider who will try and make a move here on the slopes of the Poggio, but he's got to try and stay in the first five to ten riders. Well, that's Carsten Kroon now of Team CSC, the Dutchman who's now setting the pace. Uh, Cancellara has disappeared. Uh, Kroon's turn to take over. I would say you're right, uh, because uh, Stuart O'Grady is on form and is up here, as then that's Oscar Freire too. It's always dangerous, Ferrer's either in the mix or hopelessly out of it, and he's in the mix right now. He's in the mix and he's sitting right on the wheel of Tom Boone and he knows that's a good wheel to follow. Tom Boone is not going to accelerate on the climb, but he's going to be looked after by his teammates. Not too far away is Matteo Tosato. In fact, this is Matteo Tosato now coming to the front. He's going to keep the pace nice and high. The two leaders going backwards. There is Jaroslav Popovic. He's been caught. And uh, Pelizotto, well, he's going backwards at the rate of knots. Could be Carlos Barredo setting the pace there for quick step on the front. Here is the smaller rider. And meanwhile, Milram relying on Fabio Sacchi, pretty well known in Australia, won a stage of the Tour Down Under when he used to race on Saiko. Uh, but he's also at the head of the field. There's quite a lot of riders now at this point. They're going to be thinking they have a chance here, but then they always do at this stage of the race. It all disappears on the way down. Yeah, Alessandro Pataki's up there in around about 10th position, so he's riding fairly well this afternoon. But it's important. Look at that. There's Paolo Bettini. What a great ride by him to be up at the front end still after having a very badly timed mechanical incident. That's a, a show, Phil, that he's got great form. Looking down, Kim Kirken has held that position. He's the rider with the red top to his jersey, champion of Luxembourg. He's held that position for hours upon end without doing any work. He's a clever rider. And this is Popovich. I thought we caught him. Well, we did, caught, we did catch him. He went backwards, and I think he decided he'd still got pretty good legs, so he'd have another go off the front end of the main field, and this ah. will have caught them napping. Well, they think, oh, no, not again at this stage, I would think, but that is a good move, I think, by Yaroslav Popovic. It's detracting from all of the other riders on Team Discovery Channel, and there's no immediate reaction coming from the field. It's up to someone else, Quickstep says. And there's the twist and turn to the Poggio. You can look down on the peloton, you can look up to the leaders, and there he is, Yaroslav Popovic. Somebody's made a move behind. That's a rider from Team Barlow World has seen the chance of trying to come across here. Well, that's Alexander Efenkeem here, a Russian rider on Barlow World. He is the brother, there's two Efenkeems, one Efenkeem isn't on the same team, and uh, uh, this one's a newcomer here. Well, there's Oscar Freire moving up to the front there. A little bit further forward, you can just see Frank Schleck. He's number 191. Everybody now wants to be right at the front end of this main field. Alessandro Balan is not too far away either. He's a man that I think Team Lamprey will be counting on here this afternoon. Now, as the riders start to rethink just how are they going to pack pick up here with Yanislav Popovic, the Ukrainian rider, who is clear of the field. And I was just wondering when they, when they cut back to the slow motion, I always worry in case they're going to show a crash. But he, he did wobble a bit, but he got round safely, and the Tinkoff team now trying to bring him back. Well, Team Tinkoff is a really a great team for the start of this season. I think we'll see great things, and that acceleration there has, in fact, forced a little split off the front end of the main field. You can see the way that Quickstep are riding. They don't want to accelerate too much to pull these groups back because they don't want to take any sting away from the legs of Tom Bone. And if they accelerate to nail back these groups, they'll take a little bit of his final top-end speed away for the sprint down towards the end. So they'll let the group go and slowly accelerate and bring back the group. Ricardo Serrano was the Tinkoff 
Kaufmann, who was responsible there for the capture of Efekim. And the rider in the picture now is Francesco Tomai of uh, Penaria. But this looks a little bit more under control. Nice to see Francaise de Gilles. That's Philippe Gilbert. Penaria, I should say, trying to keep the pressure nice and high. They've got a little gap, but it's not a monster gap over the front end of the main field. They can't let a man like Philippe Gilbert go free because he is a man who could come up with a win down towards the end. And Yaroslav Popovic has done the ride of the Poggio here and he's still gone got again. a bit of fire in his legs. He's gone again. Immediately on the split, Efekim thought he was coming on to the back of the group and he's coming on to the back of the split. And uh, I don't know where Popovic found the strength there to go with that split. One attack too many, I think, for Yaroslav Popovic, but this is becoming quite a difficult race here to read for the teams and trying to control it because now we have a yet another breakaway going clear here. This is Ricardo Rico who slips through on the inside and unleashes a terrific turn. Matthias Kessler is a rider in there for Team Astana, but this is a great move by young Rico. He's a new kid on the block we've all been talking about since Terreno Adriatico. Now, if you go over the top of the Poggio with a 30-second advantage, you've got a very good crack at winning this race. Well, Philippe Gilbert is flying the flag here. He, yes, he's on the French team, but he is, in fact, a Belgian rider. And uh, so the last uh, Belgian rider to win, by the way, I'm never sure which country he was a member of, but on this occasion, André Schmil was a Belgian national back in 1999. Well, he's been a Moldovian, a Russian, Ukrainian. Uh, I think, in fact, he ended up his career being a Belgian, but finally decided to go back to being a Moldovian. Well, his claim is the last Belgian to win, as we now see on Ricardo Rico. The, he is the new big name here in Italian cycling. He's got a good ally in Philippe Gilbert, a man from the Ardennes in Belgium, where hills like this abound, and Gilbert will give it everything here. Well, this is a great move of these two riders. They're both working well together. Two riders on the up and up in the sport. Gilbert is a rider in the white jersey. This is the famous corner at the top of the Poggio. This is the start of the descent. Where my mate Alain Bondu crashed him many years ago when he was racing down here for the win. And on that occasion, the winner ended up being Marc Gomez of Team Walbert at the time. And of course, he'd never have won if Alain had stayed up, right, would he? Well, probably not, because <laughs> Alain was a pretty good track man, I think I tend to remember. He was two time world champion of the pursuit. Suit. Well, we're on the plunge down now. There is a gap of 10 seconds. It may or may not be enough because once they run off the Poggio, it's a couple of kilometres, not much more than that as they race up towards the finish. And Bettini is getting himself up near the front. Kim Kirken still marshalling the attacks here. And he's the second rider in line just at the moment. Very keen, and you also noticed that Frank Schleck was keen to move. Paolo Bettini from the back of the race up to the front end of the race now. Matthias Kessler, this is the move here. This was the move of three riders just towards the summit, the acceleration of Ricardo. Rico there you can see straight off the front but Gilbert is a strong rider he's a classics rider now they're on the descent this again is a hair-raising crazy descent you've got to take risks if you've only got 15 or 20 seconds advantage with about five kilometers to go to the finish of Milan San Remo what happens if you've only got 10 because these two riders have little more than that now as Gilbert takes uh, Rico Ricardo, that writer, Ricardo, Rico, rather, right of R, R, and his same initial. Double R. Thank you very much. This is the corner coming up, Paul, isn't it? Uh, it's the right, then it's a the left corner. Wasn't that where the crash was with the Alain Bondu here? Uh, it was actually the first corner right up at the top, just as it started to rain. As you can see here, Paolo Bettini's now started to make the pressure on the front end of the main field. He's obviously, I think, decided he's going to do the work for Tom Bonin. And Bettini, who's had a very, very up and a down ride to say the least, is now trying to drag his team captain back into the fray here. He's an incredibly good bike rider and such an aggressive bike rider. Alessandro Balan, I don't think he'll be thinking about himself now. He's thinking about the man behind him. That's Daniele Benati there. He's a great sprinter himself. Well, he's very well up and I'm not sure he wants to be quite that well up at the moment. As they start, it looks like Gusev coming yeah. down there for uh, Discovery Channel. He's also another one of the up-and-comers. There's a little replay, I think it is, of uh, the switchbacks led by the world champion. And now we go back up to the two leaders. They're still clear on this very, very difficult descent. There is San Remo in the distance. He's not far away now. 
they begin to sense they've got a real chance here, but what would they need? 20 seconds when they come off the drop? Could they need to at least 30 seconds. I remember a few years ago, a man called Moreno Argentine was well in the lead on a descent like this. An Italian riding to victory in Milan San Remo, and all of a sudden, a bullet dropped out of the main field. It was called Sean Kelly, and he just caught Moreno Argentine at the one kilometer to go banner. And unfortunately for the Italian, it was Kelly who got the win on that occasion. And Victor Villani Kelly's won this a couple of times, in fact, in Milan San Remo, without doubt, the famous one day the most famous one day cycle is ever to come out of Ireland as we go in it looks like three kilometers to go to the finish and the crowd cheering on an Italian and indeed a Belgian as they race towards the line well three kilometers to go to the finish about a kilometer till they get on the flat part of the road inside San Remo and then it's the lineup for the Via Roma and it is a long Via Roma you know it's a long way to the finish line you start that sprint too early it's slightly uphill and you'll find yourself slowing down towards the end a little bit of panic now I think because these riders don't realize how strongly those two riders are working together at the front which is why Paolo Bettini here the champion of the world is absolutely sacrificing himself because he's put his bet I think this afternoon on Tom Bone and there is Gusev in about fifth position here we are off the bottom of the Poggio now onto the flat part right in the heart of San Remo very shortly they will see in the distance the Flamme Rouge there's a left hand turn then followed by a right hand turn and the Via Roma is right up in front of them this is the SS Aurelia that's the name of the road which drives right along the coast of Italy and there is the peloton being led along here by Patsy Vila as the charge is on now to try and wipe it out. The other rider there is Alessandro Balan in second place. Philippe Gilbert now is having to ride here, flick of the elbow saying, come on, well, if uh, Ricardo can't do it, then he's not going to win. He's got to try and help him. Well, they've got to work together. There is number 171, Oscar Ferreira, just sitting back there. 163, that is Tom Bonin, side by side, on the wheel of Alessandro Pataki. They're all battling now. The big names are moving to the front. They're all getting a little bit desperate, too. You've got to stay calm. You've got to play that game of poker. On the right-hand side is the casino. That's probably why they're playing poker here this afternoon. But these two guys mustn't gamble anything, because, in fact, I think it's too late. The man in red there is Gabriello Galbucci, another good sprinter too, but they're going to shut it right down and they're going to shut it down around about two kilometres from the finish here. That's it not a, a very big effort. group. That, actually, the descent of the Poggio here this afternoon has split that front end, but all of the big names, Phil, are at the front end of this group, still in control, Team Lamprey. Lamprey, and I think this is still Patsy Vila here as they go under one kilometre to go, but there's bad news for everybody because Milram have got all of the riders right up to the front now, being led by Fabio Sacchi, the strong rider who is the early lead-out man for Alessandro Pataki. Well, there's the left-hander, this is first. the right-hander. Eric Zabo was right up there as well. Once they take this right-hander, it's across the town square and they'll line up for the finish line. Well, you're right about one thing, Paul. There is a sprint here as the race referee tries to get in the middle and spoil it for everybody because his car is going to bring the rest of the field up. It's all too late. And just dropping away now is uh, Pat is Alessandro Balan for Lamprey. Now they're starting to open up the sprint. Uh, Saki will be the first. Then they'll start to file off. Pataki is tucked in there. Uh, where is Big Tom Bone? And he's not too far away from the action here as they all start to go for the line now. Well, this uh, looking like a formality at the moment here for Alessandro Pataki because now they're looking for him. A little bit of gesticulation there, but I mean, you've got to move out of the way and get out of the way because there is Oscar Freire also. And 25 kilo Oscar Freire is going to win this one and spoil the party. The man from Holland, no, right for Holland. The man from Spain has won it. You know, he's only ever the fourth Spanish victory in the history of Milan San Remo. And those victories, Paul, shared by just two men, Poble and Oscar Freire. Well, Oscar Freire, what a man. He really is the man for the grand occasions as he comes through there to get him the victory great lead out here by Eric Zabel just watch this team Milram had everything right so far there you can see in second position just starting the acceleration now is Eric Zabel himself a former winner the teammate there shouting to Alessandro Pataki Pataki starts to wind up Phil but he hasn't got the power he hasn't got the acceleration and he's easily overtaken there by Oscar Freire and he's overtaken by everybody else in the main field so Oscar Ferra has won again at Milan San Remo here and he did it so well. He came out of the shadow of everybody. Tom Bonin in the centre. He's finishing third, by the way, the same position. And Stuart O'Grady alongside Robbie McEwen. 
All the big sprinters were there, but they got it all wrong. And Oscar Freire on his day is unbeatable. Look at that sprint for second place. I'm saying Tom Bowen's third. He might be fourth, and then again, he might be second. We'll wait for the photo. Well, there's no doubt about who wins the race because Oscar Freire timed his acceleration to absolute and utter perfection there. Well, there is the result, and Alan Davis, I missed him, I forgot about his new colours in Team Discovery Channel, taking second, Bone and 30 was, McEwen got fourth, three Australians there in the top five finishers, but they're all beaten today by the man who's been a world champion on three occasions now, Oscar Freire, has got himself two Milan San Remos, and as so often happens, he comes up with the goods when it matters. So, the season is underway now and Oscar Freire is the first big winner of the year, getting victory over Alan Davis on his new Team Discovery channel. Well, we'll stay with it now for a long time this year. You stay with us and goodbye for now.